Polycystic kidney disease is not something you're going to see very frequently on the wards, but it is something that is often tested on the USMLE. So this is a good thing to talk about. This is both a problem in adults as well as a problem in very small children. So this could come up both as a pediatric problem or as an internal medicine problem. So as we talk about polycystic kidney disease, I did include renal cysts in this too. That has nothing to do with polycystic kidney disease, but it is sort of a cyst. So uh, I figured this, this would be a good place to talk about it. So the two kinds of polycystic kidney disease are the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease and the autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease presents later in childhood or in adulthood. So autosomal do dominant is often called the adult onset polycystic kidney disease, and the way you can remember that is that AD, PKD, autosomal dominant, AD for adult, but uh, this can present in kids too. So really the way you should think about it is autosomal dominant presents more uh, in non-infants, whereas autosomal recessive presents in little, little tiny babies. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, generally the symptoms on presentation are gonna be flank pain and hematuria. It's not something that you're going to pick up when the baby is born. Autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, uh, it, it presents in infancy, and it can also be diagnosed prenatally on sonogram. So this is not something that you're not going to find out until adulthood. This is going to be in your face right away. So autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, in addition to being more severe, it's going to present earlier. And it presents with large flank masses uh, and hepatic abnormalities, as well as Potter sequence facies, which I'll show you in a little bit. And then the renal cysts we'll talk about at the end. So autosomal dominant versus autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. So I put sort of the, uh, because they do overlap, I put the, uh, the individual uh, sort of distinguishing factors uh, on, on both of these and then what they have in common. So you're going to know the difference between the two of these based on when they present. That's going to be the most obvious things. But what both of these have in common is that they're both hereditary renal cysts. They're both diagnosed or can be diagnosed on ultrasound. They can both also give rise to hepatic cysts. They can give rise to hypertension, which is simply due to activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. They're both ultimately going to re result in end-stage renal disease, and in both of them, the treatment is focused on the complications of the disease. We can't actually treat the disease itself. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, or the, the later uh, presenting PKD, is these patients are going to generally be normal at birth, and it's usually going to present in childhood or adulthood. The common presenting symptoms are mild flank pain or frequent urinary tract infection. It can also present with stones, and these patients may have a history of abdominal or inguinal hernia. It's usually not going to be at the front of your mind, so you're, you're usually going to be treating these patients for other things, and when you add the symptoms along with the history, along with your physical, you'll start to develop this picture that looks like autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Now what's really going to tip you off is that these patients are going to have, if you, if you do a good history, you're going to have a patient with a family history of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. So one of their parents has it. Uh, on physical exam, you're going to see, you may see hypertension or high normal blood pressure, but that's only going to be in the adults. So if it is a child that's presenting with autosomal polycystic kidney disease, you're not going to see uh, hypertension or even elevated blood pressure on exam. So I wouldn't really re rely on the physical exam if it's, if it's a child. I'd look more towards the history and the symptoms. The labs, like I said, autosomal dominant PKD is not going to be at the forefront of your mind when you have these presenting symptoms. If you have a patient with flank pain, what are you going to think of? You're going to think of possibly 
uh, pyelonephritis. You're going to think of uh, maybe a UTI. Uh, you might even think of uh, stones if the pain is, is significant enough. So you're not going to be thinking autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. This is just this is going to be something more that that uh, you're going to gather once you get the history and you get the, uh, the 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 presenting symptoms and you combine the two of them together. Your labs may show renal dysfunction, like a high creatinine. Uh, often you'll have a normal UA, so you may this may be a patient that presents with flank pain and they have a history of frequent UTIs, but this time they have flank pain and you get a urinalysis and they're normal. And so you might do other imaging studies. You might get a CT, you might get a sonogram, and, uh, and then that may push you towards the diagnosis. So your diagnosis, like I said, is really going to be your family history along with the flank pain. So if they have a family history of, of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, that right there should push you towards your diagnosis. But if they just say they have a family history of, of kidney disease or they have a family history of people on dialysis, that should also be, be uh, making you think, I should probably get a CT or a sonography. Your diagnosis uh, modality of choice is going to be sonography just because it's cheaper than CT and because this is relatively obvious on the sonogram. So the management for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is going to be focused on the hypertension if it exists. So you'll use ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, usually ACE inhibitors. Uh, patients will generally go on to develop end-stage renal disease, so these patients should be in consultation with a nephrologist. There is also an increased risk for berry aneurysms, uh, so these patients should be advised of what the symptoms of, of a ruptured aneurysm are. And the USMLE does like to present you a patient with a berry aneurysm, so you get a neurology question, and then it will say which of the following disorders may be uh, as most likely to be coexistent in this patient. And autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease would be the answer. So that's a way I've seen it presented. Uh, so be aware of the existence of berry aneurysms, of hepatic cysts, uh, in, in consort with ADPKD. Now, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease is distinct in that it's going to be noted almost universally on prenatal ultrasound by, by the OBGYN, and it will definitely be apparent at birth. So what are you going to see on ultrasound? So if this is presented as an OBGYN question, you know, what is wrong with this baby, you're going to see oligohydramnios and you're going to see a uh, possibly a flank mass in, in the fetus. And that could also impede delivery. So this could be presented to you as an OBGYN question. It could also be presented to you as a pediatric question in as much as the patient could be uh, just born. So you could see abdominal enlargement in the neonate, pulmonary hypoplasia, hepatosplenomegaly, potter facies, abnormal extremities, polydipsia, polyuria. So the polydipsia and polyuria are due to the renal failure in as much as that you have uh, concentration problems. The potter facies and abnormal extremities are going to be secondary to the oligohydramnios. So the baby doesn't have any fluid cushioning, and so it's, it's disrupted the baby's intrauterine growth. And then the hepatosplenomegaly is due to hepatic abnormalities that are in consort with autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. So on physical exam, these neonates are going to have anatomical abnormalities. So they'll have the potter facies and the abnormal extremities. They'll also have hypertension, which is something that you don't commonly see in, in children. So that should definitely tip you off towards a renal problem anytime a child has hypertension. And then a lot of times you'll see signs related to congestive heart failure. Your labs uh, will show renal insufficiency, so a high creatinine. And then your diagnosis is, when you have these presenting symptoms, this history, uh, 
and these physical uh, and laboratory abnormalities. The diagnosis is going to be apparent, but technically you can confirm it with an ultrasound or with genetic testing. So this is what I was talking about earlier, the Potter facies. So uh, you have a, uh, the ears are relatively low set. Uh, you've got a small chin. Uh, and then also the, the, uh, the extremity abnormalities. They're more, uh, in this baby, you more see it in the legs. Uh, but these arms are, uh, these arms, well, I wouldn't say these arms are abnormal. I would say primarily the, the major defect is in the legs. What uh, both of these come from is uh, just the oligohydramnios. So you may see this in in a baby due to other causes of oligohydramnios, such as uh, uh, just simply functional problems of the kidney. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily, uh, or or simply problems of the of the urinary tract. So if you see a child with Potter facies. Don't necessarily think that it's it's due to autosomal dot or recessive polycystic kidney disease. It could be due to other things. This is what happens to a baby when there is not enough fluid uh, uh, surrounding it in the uterus. So this is uh, a, a manifestation of, of autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, but not necessarily a... Uh, a uh, diagnostic feature. Okay, so this is just, now this isn't necessarily recessive or dominant. This is just, a, and this is an adult, so it's probably autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, but uh, this is just cysts in the kidney. And this is what I wanted to, to demonstrate that, you know, it's very clear that this patient has multiple cysts in their kidney, so polycystic kidney disease. And you know, these kidneys are extremely enlarged, and uh, here you don't see it as much, um, but this is very, very apparent. You've got uh, this, so here's your psoas muscle, and uh, your kidneys should usually stop at about right here, but these kidneys are so enlarged, they're about triple their normal size. Uh, so they're going all the way up, you know, you got, you're probably at about your ninth ninth rib here. So you're pushing up on the diaphragm even. And so this is a severe case. This is uh, obviously uh, an autopsy, uh, but you can see more three-dimensionally what this looks like. So just lots of cysts on your kidney. And the ureters are normal. Okay, so renal cysts are very common. And when I say very common, I mean Actually, a majority of patients will have these over the age of 50. So you'll often see these on CT. And so a lot of times uh, the USMLE will tell you you've got a 65-year-old patient that's in for blah, 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 and here's their CT. They may show you a CT or they may uh, explain that there's a cyst in the kidney. What's your next step? And what you need to know is what renal cysts do we work up and which renal cysts do we not do anything for. So like I said, they're asymptomatic. They're going to be found incidentally. And if it's a renal cyst and the wall is smooth, so it's pretty much symmetrical, you've got a normal wall, and there is no debris, so there's nothing inside of it. It just... Uh, it's a the, the inside is completely homogeneous, then you don't need to do anything. If there's an irregular wall, and I mean highly irregular wall, or there's debris inside, and this will be apparent when I show this to you, then you should aspirate this cyst to exclude malignancy. Not all irregular renal cysts are malignant, most of them are benign, but you do need to exclude malignancy. Um, so, okay, so here's a benign renal cyst. Uh, you can see here that it's a homogeneous inside and you've got a normal, uh, a normal wall. So it's a large benign renal cyst, but it is a benign cyst nonetheless. Here's another one. So homogeneous on the inside, normal, uh, uh, smooth wall on the outside, and highly symmetrical. Okay, here's an irregular cyst on, this is on ultrasound. 
So what you have here is you do have a normal wall. It's symmetrical, but inside you have debris. So this stuff could be cancerous, so you will need to aspirate this cyst. Okay, so here is a CT, and here's your kidney, and here's your cyst. Here's a normal kidney on the right, and here's a kidney on the left here that has a cyst. And so you have both an irregular wall, and you also have debris on the inside. So this needs to be aspirated. Here's another one. Uh, this one's on the left side. Uh, so this is uh, it's relatively symmetrical, but it's not a homogeneous inside. So this also needs to be aspirated.